I'm Colin Sanders and you're listening to the History Books Review. I read history books and I review them. Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire Chapter 16 Persecution Imagine no religion. It's easy if you try. So sang John Lennon. I do miss you, John. Wouldn't it be nice to think you were up there somewhere, still able to hear what we are saying about you, and able to realise how much we still all think of you down here? I imagine that the followers of Jesus felt much the same. Their charismatic leader, who had meant so much to them, was dead. Who can blame them for wishing him back to life, in some form or another? It's a very human and very understandable feeling. And that is how I think Christianity got started. Jesus was a man who inspired a lot of love, and deep down, that is what it's all about. It has been twisted into some pretty ugly forms since then, but there is still maybe something wholesome buried extremely deeply at its core. So, I have a feeling the very first Christians were probably quite a likeable bunch. But why was this originally harmless cult persecuted so ferociously from the very start? It isn't as if the Romans were routinely intolerant in religious matters. Far from it. They were happy to respect other people's gods. New ones acquired abroad could often become very fashionable. You were welcome to embrace as many or as few as suited your taste. You could have none at all if you wished, like many of the Epicureans. Marcus Aurelius chose to believe in them all, but thought that they had better things to do with themselves than bother with the puny affairs of humans. Religious persecution was not so much rare as simply not really something that would occur to anyone. And yet, as soon as Christianity appeared, its adherents fell foul of the authorities, if the Acts of the Apostles detailed in the Bible are to be believed. But perhaps they aren't to be believed. They were written a long time after the event, and have been extensively modified over the years. Gibbon starts his history of the impact of Christianity with the first independent accounts of the persecution of the Christians in the reign of Nero. These, by contrast to the Bible, seem reliable enough. Rome had burnt down. There were mutterings that Nero had been behind it. Nero looked around for a scapegoat, and it looks like the Christians fitted the bill. The problem is that it's hard to believe that only some 30 years after the death of Christ, there were already enough Christians in Rome to make them viable scapegoat material. Gibbon is well aware of this problem, and comes up with an ingenious theory to get round it. Nero's wife, Papea, may have been Jewish. If so, she might have been aware of the Christians in their capacity as a troublesome Jewish sect. There were plenty of Jews around, and they would have made much more credible scapegoats. Maybe Papea diverted Nero towards the Christians as a tactic to save the Jews. But, although Nero's persecution is attested to by Tacitus and others, we don't really know too much about it. The fire in Rome took place in 64 AD, we hear very little about the Christians for the next couple of centuries. Pliny the Younger corresponded with the Emperor Trajan about how to deal with the Christians in Asia Minor, the province he governed, in letters dated to the year 112. He had decided to execute some Christians that he had received an anonymous tip-off about. But he seems very unsure what the whole thing was about. In fact, he had to have a couple of, the, um, couple of them tortured to try and get some idea what was going on. Gibbon rings the maximum amount of information from the account. He points out that Pliny was a man of the world with plenty of contacts and experience of the legal system, but nonetheless he had no precedent to draw on to deal with with this new sect. They must have been pretty rare. This kind of inference is what historians call reading the unwitting text. Gibbon worked out the technique himself without any professional training and he was a natural at it. It's Hard to say what effect Pliny's actions had on the Christians, if it had any effect at all. In any case, further references to them remain rare throughout the period of the Five Good Emperors. There is some very dubious evidence that Philip the Arab might have been a sympathiser, but if he was, he was pretty discreet about it. It is only in the reign of Decius that there was any unambiguous and systematic persecution of Christians. Decius was on a bit of a moral crusade to restore the empire to its previous virtues. He had already revived the ancient role of censor, 
as part of his plan to keep citizens on the straight and narrow. An organised group of pacifists espousing some new belief system that was clearly not remotely part of the Roman tradition was bound to get on his wrong side. He decided to take serious action, and this serious action started in January 250. As persecutions go, it was on the mild end of the spectrum. This is evident by looking at the career of Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage. As the leading Christian in North Africa, he was obviously going to be a target. When things kicked off, he was faced with a choice between martyrdom or dishonour. Luckily, he was spared this choice by some divine inspiration, in the form of a vision telling him what to do. As instructed by Jesus, he went into hiding, but carried on running his diocese by letter. His exile wasn't very long-lived, and he was soon back with his flock. Some of them had bowed to the authorities, but others had stuck to their principles. This led to an argument, and Cyprian had to defend his corner. This all shows a number of things. For a start, it was clear enough that the Christians hadn't been massacred to a man, because obviously they could still argue about the, uh, the events afterwards. So, being a Christian openly wasn't in itself a death sentence. And Christians were secure enough to be able to openly debate just how much cooperation they were prepared to give to the government. Cyprian did get martyred in the end, but let's have a quick look at his character first. He was an upper-class Roman who converted to Christianity as an adult after some success in public life. He was well-educated and uh, many of his writings have survived. He seems to have been a very able leader, certainly according to his own writing, but also by the position he held in the face of a lot of competition. He was also pretty political, taking a position in the internal arguments of the Christians at the time. Cyprian's martyrdom seems to have been a surprisingly dignified and well-ordered business when it finally came about. The persecution of Decius did not continue after his death battling with the Goths. This enabled Cyprian to return to his bishop's role in Carthage. A few years later, Valerian started up again. Now, Cyprian had been able to deflect criticism of his less than heroic tactics in the face of the earlier persecution, but he couldn't get away with it twice. There are only, only so many times you can pull the I had a vision line. This time, he was going to have to accept martyrdom. But the whole affair seems to have been run almost as a publicity stunt on behalf of Christianity. OK, he was going to be beheaded, but by Roman standards this was pretty civilised. Um, they had much worse versions of the death penalty, as we all know. But with the possible exception of the getting his head cut off bit, most of the circumstances must have been pretty much just how Cyprian would have wanted them. Cyprian was held under house arrest for about a year, while the authorities decided what to do about him. They don't seem to have been particularly anxious to get rid of him, and even when the final instructions came through, they gave him the option of a last-minute recantation. This set up a great dramatic scene. The official's visit to Cyprian's villa became a public occasion with crowds of onlookers. When he refused to recant, a huge cry went up. The sentence was carried out, and that very night, the body of the newly made martyr was born in a torch-lit procession by his followers to be buried in the Christian cemetery. To our modern media-savvy brains, the whole thing just reeks of ineptitude on the part of the authorities. The emperors never seemed to realise what they were dealing with. The rules for dealing with the Christians were designed to encourage them to desist, not to drive them underground. Torture was used not to extract confessions or information, but to encourage them to recant. Witnesses risked punishment themselves if they didn't make the charges stick. All in all, the risk of embracing Christianity was not particularly great. If you did get caught, a quick sacrifice to a god got you off the hook. There were certainly not a steady stream of Christians being thrown to the lions. The Roman Empire was a shockingly brutal and violent place, which showed scarcely any respect for human rights and dignity, yet somehow... Faced with this huge internal threat to its traditions and its internal order, it turned into a cute little pussycat rolling over and waiting for its tummy to be tickled. You feel like yelling, get a grip! These guys are going to take over if you don't get real about your persecuting. 
Like a lot of other issues, it took Diocletian to take a calm look at the situation and get some kind of project planning into the operation. With his organisational skill and awareness of human nature, he was the first emperor to finally get the persecutions set up on a reasonably effective basis. Like most of his activities, his good sense can be detected. He ended the legal protection of the Christians. He also took action against the organisation. It was the organised nature of the Christians, after all, was the basic problem. He had churches destroyed, Bibles burnt and funds seized. Even now, actual killings were still a rarity, and Diocletian seems to have limited the early stages to the Nicomedia area, where he could personally supervise it. You can't help thinking that his heart wasn't really in it. Shortly after the programme was initiated, the Imperial Palace caught a light. Twice. Diocletian's life itself was at risk. Was this revenge by the fanatical Christians? It's a possibility. It was certainly seized on as a justification by Galerius, who had taken a deep dislike to the cult. It has even been suggested that he may have been behind himself as a justification for stiffer measures. Galerius was to continue Diocletian's persecutions with much more enthusiasm during his own short reign. At this distance in time, we'll never know. It seems most likely that the fire was an accident. Palaces do, after all, catch lighter from time to time. These things uh, usually are um, straightforward enough, but conspiracy theories are much more fun, aren't they? Even Galerius eventually gave up on his crusade against the Christians. He carried on despising them, but he did issue a general pardon. Not long afterwards, Constantine, who seems to have been a sincere, if maybe somewhat flexible, Christian himself, issued the famous Edict of Milan, formally allowing religious freedom throughout the empire. It's tempting to imagine relieved Christians emerging from their places of hiding, blinking wonder at a world where they were finally safe. But it really wasn't like that. By this time, active persecution in the west of the empire was a distant memory, and it had been over for several years in the east. It seems a lot more significant with hindsight than it must have done at the time. Uh, the Christians were now safe from persecution by the pagans, but I dare say the majority of pagans were just as glad as anybody else that religious strife was now over, and they were probably looking forward to a more peaceful era ahead where nobody would be killed simply because of what they believed. If only. The idea that the Christians in the Roman Empire suffered continual and relentless persecution is a deep-seated one, and one which is still being taught even when I was at school. Well, as you've seen, it wasn't like that at all. One view you hear quite a lot from non-believers is that religion always causes war and conflict. But the Roman Empire was full of religious diversity, and even though there was plenty of violence, religion was rarely the pretext for it. You could make a case that the Jewish rebellions are motivated by religious zeal, but given that the Jews were tolerated before and after them, this doesn't really stand up. But there were people killed. How many? Uh, in particular, how many were killed in the major persecutions initiated by Diocletian? Gibbon has tried to come up with a figure. He uses some numbers uh, by Constantine's friend and biographer Eusebius, who says that 92 Christians were martyred in Palestine. As Palestine was 1 16th of the Eastern Empire, if you uh, extrapolate over the whole thing, you get a, a total number killed over the whole 10 years of around 1,500. Or, as Gibbon puts it, an annual consumption of around 150. Looking at the way he makes his calculation, it is pretty clear that Gibbon has, quite deliberately, overestimated the true total. But his number is low enough to justify his next point. The violence perpetrated by Christians on other Christians has got a much greater body count. It still feels controversial to say it, but the facts are stark. You often hear people say that religion has caused more wars than anything else. This isn't really true. The pre-Christian world was full of religion and it was full of wars, but there was no particular connection between the two. The link between violence and religion first emerged during the persecution of the early church, when Christians chose to start dying for their faith. 
it was a short step from dying for it to killing for it. With the arrival of Christianity, a new level of fanaticism enters history. Men had fought, killed and carried out unspeakable atrocities before, and would continue to do so. But now, in addition to killing with the motive of taking away other people's property and sometimes their liberty, they would additionally be killed for having the wrong ideas in their heads. We were seeing a lot more of this gruesome stuff in the history to be detailed in the chapters ahead. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode of the History Books Review podcast. Uh, apologies, I've had rather more technical problems than I usually have, including having my uh, microphone pinched from my, from, by my son for this last bit. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks for listening.